The following is intended for mature audiences only. Discretion is advised. I always lived near enough to a 7-Eleven or to a uh, whatever else that my friends and I would go and blow our whole allowances on comic books and garbage. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah. I think that was most of my diet for a good period there. What's up, besties? Welcome back to another episode of Child Like a Best with Mike Valdez. I am still the second part of that title. I hope you're having a great week this week. Thank you so much for tuning into this week's episode. I'm very excited for you to listen. Uh, this week, I actually had a really great idea where I would tell you what cereal we were having on the podcast before we actually started the podcast. So during the intros, I would just tell you what cereal, because maybe you might want to eat some cereal with us as you listen or as you watch. So this week's cereal is actually Pandora Flakes. I'm not sure if you have had them before. There is a way to recreate them if you would like to, but they are of the Frosted Flakes variety. And essentially, I would say the best way to recreate it, if you can't find Pandora Flakes, would be to get Frosted Flakes and Oops All Berries and mix that into one bowl. That would be probably the best way to get what Pandora Flakes are. And I picked that cereal for a very specific guest, which I'm very excited to tell you about. This week's guest is Drew McWeeny. Drew McWeeny is a podcaster, also a film uh, critic and a film journalist who runs Formerly Dangerous and also has been on Netflix working on David Fincher's uh, Voyeur. And he has also worked with so many, so many cool people and written on so many awesome things. This podcast has so many stories. I'm so blessed that I was able to talk to him about that. Oh my gosh, Movie Trivia Schmodown. He was on Movie Trivia Schmodown. Yeah. I mean, this guy has done so many cool things. And as a film lover myself, it was just really awesome to be able to talk to him for an hour and some change. And I really think that you guys are going to love this episode. So without further ado, please enjoy with a bowl of Pandora Flakes. My episode with Drew McWeeny. Since right. I was seven years old, I think I've been in a movie theater at least once a week, every week. And right. most of the time, more than that, I, I'm an addict. I, I make no apologies yeah. for it. I am a utterly depraved <laughs> cinema addict and have been since I was yeah. seven. And, you know, I remember the theater I was in when that happened. And I think since then, it has been a very special experience to me and something that I've tried to not only pass on in my writing, but pass on to my kids, pass on yeah. to my friends. Um, you know, uh, there are so many of my favorite moments. Uh, from my life and from my friendships and from various relationships I've had that have happened in movie theaters. And yeah. I don't think of movies as a private experience. I think of them as a communal experience and You're my community right. are the people that I found at movie theaters and at festivals and at events that I've been at. And I really think I have found my family around the world because of this. And yeah, the fact that the, the fact that writing about movies the way I did is the thing that opened those doors for me. Um, is something I'll always be amazed by and grateful for. But I'm not surprised because I do think it's a thing that bonds us. And I think when you meet somebody who, you know, before the internet, I think one of the ways you established shorthand with people was the, the movies that you quoted, the movies that you carried around inside of you. And it was before yeah. home video. That's what you had. You had the movies that you had memorized that had just gone into your right. head so fully that when you met somebody and they knew who the knights who said knee were, you were like, okay, I know you, exactly. I see you, you and I are friends already. And so I yeah. do think that that has only become more expansive the longer I've done this. Yeah, man, you're absolutely right in that it, it is a very much a communal experience and it's in a weird way. It's like kind of going away, you know, because uh, not only because of home video, but also just because I, I think part of the process of movies now is that you go see guardians three. And then the article about how someone just got cast in guardians four comes out. And then they're just going back into the rumor mill of it all. And you're already by so sometimes by the time a movie comes out, you're disappointed because you've been hearing about it for two years. 
you know, I think at a certain point that I, I equate it to the experience that you have when you go to Walt Disney World and you go to that right. theme park. And before you ever get in the Haunted Mansion, they know that you're going to be in line for an hour and a half. And so they start right. the attraction way outside. So everything you walk by is part of the ride. All the gravestones right. that you're looking at are part of the ride. There's sounds that you're hearing that are part of the ride. Same thing with Pirates of the Caribbean or really any of the big themed rides at Disney. You're in them even before you're in them. And the problem yeah. is pop culture has become the ride queue at Disney World and nothing else. <laughs> so you get to the end what a and way it's to just put an it. exit. And you're like, what was the, the whole thing was the line? And it is. Pop yeah. culture is essentially the line. And <laughs> there are a lot of people who I think are happier processing pop culture now as a hypothetical thing in a box that can be anything because it's not open yet. So they attach yeah. all their hopes and dreams and thoughts and feelings to this thing that doesn't exist yet. And then if it is not exactly that, it's wrong or it's bad. And then they're also immediately on to the next long box that they can theoretic, you know, that theoretically, uh, fantasize about so it, it's great hype has become the product in a lot of ways i also worry, yeah so much so i also worry that we have a generation now that just isn't getting the habit yeah and if you don't develop the yeah. habit when you're young if you don't learn to love to go to movie theaters when you're young um you'll you'll never pick it up it just won't be a thing that become they're learning to find it on other screens. They're learning to find their fulfillment on other screens. And so that big screen experience is not important to them in the way it was to my generation. We would go to the theater. We would just go to the movies. Hey, you want to go to the movies? Yeah, let's go to the right. movies. And then you'd go up and you'd see what was playing and you'd find something to go see. And if there were 10 movies, you'd find something. Even if it was terrible, you'd find something. And I think yeah. now you go to the theater to see Avatar 2 or you go to the theater to see Guardians 3. And that's yeah. the reason you're there for the brand and to be part of the conversation and to like kind of fulfill your place in the hype machine. And so it does not feel like it is the same culture that's being passed down to them. And I worry that there will come a point where they just don't think of movie theaters as an option. Yeah, that's that is an accurate way of putting it. And I mean, certainly you know it's it's also just getting weird too because like at least for me um as a millennial and and i i just kind of feel a lot of social anxiety especially because of the pandemic mm -hmm. so like sometimes movies can bring out that social anxiety in me sure. you know which is super weird yeah and like and what's even and here's what's crazy is like i'll have that social anxiety when i'm watching a movie in a smaller theater. Then sometimes I'll watch these event movies and, and I'm just there like the whole time. And, and I'm not feeling any, anything, which is, I guess it's just a testament to the, to the brand and how it is in my heart because it's, I mean, anxiety is all in your head anyway, but you know, it's, it's wild, man. You're absolutely right. I, you know, for me, it was always a big part of my, my growing up and theaters were cheaper. I think it was an easy, an easy alternative to a lot of things that my parents could have had me go and do. And I was always close enough to movie theaters that I could ride on bikes with my friends and just go see stuff on our own. And yeah, I, yeah. I really, I lived in movie theaters growing up and I, I was so rabid about it that I started working at 14. I found a job at a golf course. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And I wanted to be a caddy because I loved Caddyshack and I thought it looked like a great job. And it was. Sure. It was a great job for a 14 and 15 year old. But I knew I wanted to work yeah. in movie theater as well. And so I moved to Florida and there was a sign that there was an AMC being built and that it was going to open in the spring right before I turned 16. And so I contacted AMC's corporate office and was like, when that theater opens, I want to work there. They were like, you're a weirdo, but okay, um, sure. <laughs> and they took all my information. And then I went and interviewed. And on my 16th birthday, I started at the movie theater. It was that important to me. It was like, I'm, I am ready. So I cool. cannot wait to work at a movie theater. And uh, That's so I awesome. basically never left. Yeah, my first job ever was at a movie theater as well. It's um, a great first gig. A it is a really great first job. for. I was 16 when I started, just like you. 
and that's probably the minimum age to yeah. work, right? Is yeah. 16 for I think a for movie most theater? jobs for, for any corporate job, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, that was my first job. It was at a Regal Cinemas. Nice. Um, and it was when Batman Begins came out. And I remember that they wouldn't let us go see the movie for free. <laughs> really? <laughs> Yeah, I was oh, like, no, I was no, like, no, no, you got man, robbed, what the man. Heck? That was the best part I of the gig. I totally got, I know the best part of the gig is getting to watch the movies for free. And we would so like, build things they were up, like, like, nah. Yeah, when our prints would come in, we would build things up like three or four days before the movie opened and then run the prints yeah. at midnight just to make sure that it worked. Mm-hmm. And so any employee could stay and watch the the fresh print to make sure that it was, it was good. And that was everybody's excuse to see the movie and to hang out. That's how I got to know everyone. 100%. I yeah, one hundred percent. And that summer, because it was the summer of eighty six, there were a lot of movies yeah. that people did not see coming. I remember there was very little buzz before Aliens opened. Um, it was oh, not wow. the way okay. hype is now. Alien was nineteen seventy nine. Aliens was nineteen eighty yeah. six. There had been a lifetime between those movies. So of course, for a lot of kids, especially people my age. Alien wasn't like first and foremost in their brain at that point. That summer, that was not the movie everybody was looking forward to. And I remember we did the early employee screening. And at the end of it, we were all sweating and just like hysterical. <laughs> like, what just happened in this theater? Oh, my God. And so, of course, for the entire opening weekend, anybody that came into the theater was like, are you here for Aliens? No. Go back. Get your ticket for Aliens. You've made yeah. a terrible mistake. Go see Aliens. It was We but were that's- all evangelical. Yeah, dude, but that's like the best thing about like having worked in movies or working at a video rental store is being that guy, you know, like and people having that guy to go to. And, and you know, you said some stories on other shows where you were that guy at the video store where they were like, you want a recommendation? That guy, you know, like. <laughs> I mean, it was it was truly my superpower when I moved to Los Angeles. Was, right. I was a theater manager first uh, and I moved. I had worked AMC almost exclusively in Florida. And then I moved out here. I was a manager for GCC for a little while. And that put me okay. in touch with the industry because the theater that I managed did a lot of test screenings and a lot of trade screenings. And so almost every week we had like Jeffrey Katzenberg in the theater or some director would be coming to screen their movie and do test screening. So I had to very quickly learn how to deal with those people. And it was very intimidating. And then I moved over to a Laserdisc store and it was because I had a horrifying Laserdisc (laughs) habit. Basically, I was like, (laughs) I've got to figure out how to get free rentals. I think I need to work at that store. (laughs) And so, um, (laughs) right. And yeah. And at that point they were the, Big Laserdisc store for Los Angeles. They were the um, primary store in the Valley and they had everything. That was what they prided themselves on. If it ever came out, they had a rental copy of it. And so their rental library was incredible and their clientele was almost exclusively industry. So everybody who came into the store worked in the industry on some level or was a complete movie addict. And so that was the place to be the guy. And I met so many people that way. And there were so many interesting things that dropped into my lap because of that. I met a guy who came into the the store one time and he had a script and he was like, I'm auditioning for this script for this movie and I'm going to play this guy, but I don't understand this first page. And on the first page, it was a list of things that this guy was influenced by actors and films and directors. And the script was called Reservoir Dogs. And wow. he had never heard of anybody who was on this this page. It was like Lawrence Tierney, and it was a couple of crime movies, and it was stuff like that. And so Sam right. Fuller. And so I pulled some examples for him, walked him around, got a stack of stuff for him to rent. He went back. He didn't get the part. But then when he came back in, he gave me the script. He was like, here you go. If you want to read this thing, it's pretty good. This guy's pretty good. I wish I got it. And then Man. that guy ended up directing my first play. Because we wow. started talking and that was Jerry Levine, who was in Teen Wolf and uh, uh, Born on the Fourth of July and a bunch of other stuff. Huge TV director now. But he was. Yeah, it was just it put you in a position because people would ask you the questions to just meet everybody and talk to thing, you know, talk to people about all sorts of things. Man. And how funny is that? Because immediately when you were talking about the first page, I was like, man, what a Tarantino way 
of writing a character and then it was Tarantino. It was a super bratty <laughs> move. Like and everybody who read that script had the same reaction. What? I got to do homework. What is this shit? Like the, it yeah, was so yeah, yeah. bratty and so precocious <laughs> and so him. <laughs> And pretty yeah. immediately, my friends and I were like, I kind of like this guy. I kind of like the balls yeah. of this guy. This is pretty great. Of course. Yeah. yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, that's so. I mean, as you were reading that script, you were like, I can imagine a poster on every college kid's dorm room. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, we were rabid. And then when the story started coming out of Sundance about people passing out because of the ear, it was like, oh, he did it. He did it. It's yeah, yeah. Crazy. So that's yeah. awesome. That's that's so cool. Um, you were talking about growing growing up in Florida. Where in Florida? Just out of curiosity. Well, um, my dad was a civil engineer, so we moved a lot. Okay. Um, so yeah. I have I have lived in a lot of different places. I'm from New York originally, and I okay. moved to Tampa, St. Pete when I was a kid. Okay. Um, we lived in the Dunedin side, and then St. Pete, and then moved to Texas. Uh, lived right outside of Houston in a place called Conroe. And then moved to Tennessee, lived in Chattanooga, then moved back to Tampa, then did college Man. in Tallahassee. So I moved a lot. That is a lot of moving. Holy cow. Yeah, that's a lot of first days of school with the last name McWeeny. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, not cool. <laughs> not cool. And so, every kid thinking he thought of it first. Oh, like, I, <laughs> I, I had one year where I swear to God, I had a home room and there was a kid who sat behind me. And every day when they called my name, it was like he heard it for the first time. And every yeah. day he would say the same joke like it occurred to him for the first time. Hey, man, if McDonald's had a hot dog. <laughs> oh, my God. A McQueenie. And I'm like, yeah, That's I so heard stupid. you. 800 other times yes i yeah, know i heard you 800 other times in 60 other schools <laughs> yeah, yeah. you like, aren't first that, man yeah <laughs> oh my god dude that's so funny yeah well and i then mean when it's you funny that, now it's, it's basically prison rules like you have to the first yeah. day of school you have to go all right biggest dude who laughs at the last name i gotta fucking hit him because uh it's the yeah. only way this goes down <laughs> Like, you're you no, know, you're absolutely right. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Um, and that leads to my next question, which is what kind of kid would you say that you were in school? Um, I was a I was a an Uber nerd, but I was also um because I moved so frequently, I was a bit of a chameleon. Um sure. my thing was always uh I would my first couple of weeks at school, I would do my best to be invisible. And I would wait to find out who the nerds were. And then I would hone in on the nerds and hang out right. and try to be safe. And yeah. uh, and inevitably, I would find one or two movie nerds anywhere I went. And that's where yeah. that common language thing became so important. Like, you know, first day of school somewhere, I see a kid with Yoda socks. And I'm like, oh, thank God. Thank God. <laughs> There's a kid with Yoda socks. I love I'm it. good. Yeah. You know, uh, that's so cool. And just pretty much anywhere I went, I looked for somebody who might have some of the same comment. I looked for copies of famous monsters. I looked for okay. comic books. I looked for anything where I was like, I have a common language with this person. I at least yeah. start there. Um, and that was a big part of moving a lot, I think. And it's one of the reasons that I love pop culture and movies so much is because even if I moved, we all saw the same movies. Yes. So, when I went from Florida to Texas, you still knew what Star Wars was. So at the very right. least, we we have that in common. And I feel like that was one of the reasons that I vanished so thoroughly into movies is movies were consistent, if nothing else was. Right. No, that's that's a great way to put it. I really relate to that, man. I mean, I'm an actor. So like, I mean, I, and not only that, but like I I am a comedian as well so that that is my brain like i'm very much a chameleon and i relate to that wanting to feel invisible for a little bit and then finding my tribe yeah and then once you do you're just like and and sure i would talk to other kids because i was a social person but at the same time it was like how can i find my way like how can i find my groove with these people you well, know and usually it was movies you know yeah. it was quoting anchorman or something you know i felt i felt a little out of step as a kid to begin with i am um, i was precocious uh i at 
three, I think my parents had really, both my parents worked. And so my parents put me in front of Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers a lot when I was very, very little. And it was that awesome. early generation of 70s PBS when people didn't know what PBS really was going to do yet. But they were like, right. I don't know. We'll give it a try. See if it's any good for them. And I was three and a half or four when my parents came home one day and I told them I could read the newspaper. And then I sat down <laughs> and I read the front page of the newspaper. to them. They were like, what wow. the hell is going on? So by kindergarten, I was reading books and frequently right. for kindergarten, first and second grade, while kids were learning to read and stuff, I was just put in a corner with a stack of things to just go through because I was already pretty voracious. And so that yeah. already made me feel like a little weirdo. I moved Did from you New York to Florida, so I had something? a thick, uh, I didn't skip classes because at that point, moving from place to place, like you didn't really, like every school district was a little different and every, so. Sure. So it was just, it was weird. And it was that time where they were trying the gifted program, which I think fucked up a generation. And uh, <laughs> right. did, like, yes, there were all these right. things that they did wrong with kids who were precocious. And, um, yeah. but for me, it was books and movies and things. I just, I really vanished into them as much as I could. And I, mm -hmm. do, and I do think for, uh, I also think I saw some movies very early that I probably shouldn't have. I think the seventies were very permissive. And so, right. We had babysitters sometimes who would take us to the theater and okay. I had a babysitter at seven, take us to see the exorcist and Jesus um, Christ. thought it was a documentary. <laughs> I didn't know what the fuck was happening. Uh, of it course. Was, yeah. <laughs> I, it broke me. Like it was truly way too much to handle. And I mean, gotta be honest, dude. I saw that movie when I was like 15 and it broke me. So, I mean, it's, I yeah, get you. I will like, say <laughs> I, I built it up so much in talking to my own kids about, horror films and what scares me and i built up the exorcist so much and they had seen so many other things and by the time i was like all right guys like, i think i'm ready to show you this movie i showed it to them and they went all right i mean it's a movie relax yeah <laughs> they were like it's good <laughs> like, but you really had us worked up man we thought like the devil yeah. was gonna be in the living room with us you yeah you really but had it, us going <laughs> like, yeah, gotta be you honest dude at I that time that, man, it was the devil was right there. Yes. And that's the thing. It's all about, I think, how you see things. I, I made mistakes with them, certainly showing them things. I scared the mm -hmm. crap out of Toshi, my oldest kid. Um, he was four, I think, or five. And he was starting to get interested in Spielberg. And he was starting to ask questions about, you know, some of those movies. And right. I remember, I, I don't know what the hell I was thinking, but I put on Twilight Zone, the movie. And we made mm. it all the way to Dan Aykroyd turning around in the car. Hey, you want to see something really scary? And when he turned yeah. around, Toshi stood up and tears shot sideways out of his eyes as he left the room. And I was like, oh, God, I have done something terrible. Never felt worse. You made as your kid anime being. cry. Oh, my God. <laughs> it was so bad. And uh, so and he didn't want to watch anything scary for like four years after that like nothing oh not i don't blame him. costello meet frankenstein no too much right. like <laughs> it was just off the table so it really i think with horror films especially you got to really pick the moment you introduce stuff to kids dude and and i'll be honest i i was pretty impressionable as a kid as well and i grew up relatively um like conservative so because my my family is very christian and uh and i grew up in that lifestyle so because of that i wasn't really allowed to watch you know a lot of pg-13s or r-rated things you know mm -hmm. i mean i would sneak them I'm, I'm human but like you know at the end of the day uh i i remember i had to have been eight years old and my family was like you know what this movie Twister with Helen Hunt, you know, it seems like a really great movie. We watched it and I didn't get through the first scene uh, because and, and looking at it now, anybody would be like, this is ridiculous. Like, why would you ever be scared of it? But the reason why I was scared of it was because I was young enough. Um, and also the character that gets sucked up by the Twister in the first part of that movie looked like my dad. OK. And so I got very, very afraid about these things like coming when, you, like, when you're little, like you away my totally family. Get, yeah. You don't totally get the line like movies and TV work different on you at a certain age. And I think we forget yeah. that when we get older, we forget how 
weird and thin that line is between us and and what we're watching on the screen. When I was very little, my dad looked a lot like Mr. Brady, like looked a sure. lot like Mike Brady. And my dad was an mm-hmm. engineer, so he'd leave with tubes and stuff. And then Mr. Brady would show yeah. up with tubes and stuff. And there was yeah. about six months where I thought that was my dad's day job. I thought my dad had sure. another family that he went to on TV because I was just, <laughs> he looked so much like him and it, I, TV can really play with you when you're a little kid. Like, you know, I yeah. do think, and I think when you're raised with things being off limits, I think it only reinforces that, you know, I, yeah. uh, my parents didn't set a lot of boundaries for, well, that's not true for films. They did. They made the mistake with books. They, they were like, well, if you can, okay. if you're interested in a book, Pick it up and read it. We don't care. Right. Like, really? That, that's a wild, wild mistake. But OK. Well, and there's read, no ratings in books. That's why. I read crazy <laughs> things when I was young. And so of I course, truly think Stephen books, King books expanded that. my brain way before movies could because they mm-hmm. kind of held off as long as they could with movies. But home video fucked that up for them because my parents sure. were early investors in a video store in like 1981. And so everything that the store ordered would come through our house to get processed. We'd have to open it and put stickers on it and put the barcode and everything and enter it in a a database. And that meant that every single movie that got sent to the store was in our house unguarded while my parents were out working. I watched everything, man. (laughs) I watched every (laughs) tape that came through that house. And I watched things that I didn't even understand just because it was rated R. Like I remember sure. 10 putting on an unmarried woman by Paul Mazursky and I'm like, oh, this is going to be hot. <laughs> and I got a divorce <laughs> drama with Jill Clayburgh that was <laughs> decidedly not hot. But it was like, man, I'm going to watch yeah. this. I'm going to figure out adults. This is it. This is all right. Here we go. That's anything. The funniest, the funniest thing ever, man, when you're 13 and you just you're just edging on an R-rated movie thinking that it's going to have some sort of side nipple or something in what's it. The, uh, <laughs> what's the Simpsons joke where Barton Milhouse are walking out of a theater and it's Naked Lunch rated R and they're like, well, I can think of yeah. two things wrong with that title. And yeah, <laughs> just the most disappointing thing to sneak into when you're 10. <laughs> it's so funny, man. And you're absolutely right because I am Barton Millhouse in that situation. When I think naked lunch, I think sandwiches and naked girls. Like that's yeah. what I think. <laughs> well, now do you you know when you so your first R rated movie was some was it something that you went and saw that you snuck, or were you shown an R rated movie and that kind of opened your eyes to oh shit, there's another world out there and I gotta get in on it? Oh, man, that's a great question. I believe it was the same situation that you had where a babysitter took me to see The Matrix. Oh, well, yeah. OK. Life changing. <laughs> yeah. I think fairly it was fucking awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was awesome. It's great when you can pinpoint your first R. I, I actually really yeah. wanted to, to be very careful and specific when the boys finally saw a rated R movie. And it was after my right. divorce and and when I kind of had more time with the boys, just me and them. And I was thinking about it, like, what am I going to show them? And years later, I was at a party at Fox and across the room, it was a Christmas party that they uh, they had each year where they would like bring their biggest stars and their biggest celebrities and then a mm-hmm. few journalists. And the thing was, it's loose. Everybody's a little drunk. You can really get some good yeah. quotes. Go to town. So of I'm kind of standing there. <laughs> And I look over and at the dessert table by himself, nobody talking to him, Jim Cameron. And I'm like, fuck, yeah. Wow. All right. So I walk over and I'm like, I'm taking this opportunity. Let's talk. And this is not long after Avatar. So this was like 2011 or so. And uh, I walk over and no, no, this was a little later. This must have been 2015. So he had made something for a little while. And uh, and I walk over and we start talking and. um Almost immediately, and I I met him before, but this was the first time I'd seen him in a while. And I said, so I have to tell you, I showed my boys their first R-rated movie ever recently, and it was The Terminator. And he goes, huh. Hell yeah. You know, I got an X five times for that, and they basically just finally gave up and gave me an R, even though it was still the same movie. So good (laughs) parenting. (laughs) <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I was like, all right, all right. It's it's pretty extreme. But yeah, I, I mean, that's an R rated movie. You I, but it, yeah, it, you're absolutely but it's right. So it feels 
like the right kind of R-rated movie. It's a little scary. Yeah. It's a little sexy, but it's not insane. It's like it's yeah. all the things you want from an R when you're a kid. And exactly. it'll feel insane the first time you see it. You know, weirdly enough, and, and I haven't shared this story in a while, but you're the perfect person to share this story with again. Uh, when I was a kid, I might have been maybe seven or eight years old and um, some kids from church uh, w- that lived across the street were like, hey, Mikey, we just got the new laser disc of Dumb and Dumber. You want to watch it with us? And I was like, yeah, let's watch it. Hell I'd yeah, never heard go. of the movie. Yeah, I never. Yeah, <laughs> damn piss crap. Like, <laughs> like, and uh, I went, I went over to their house, and then out of, you know, just out of curiosity, I guess my dad came over and watched the movie with us. Now, everything was fine uh, for the most part, and then it got to the scene, this the hilarious uh, daydream scene, or or that he's having while he's driving the car, right. And uh, as as anybody that's seen the movie knows, like they're taking off articles of clothing and then she takes off her dress and then it's the headlights of the car that's about to hit him. Now, my dad does not understand jokes. He never has. Uh, It's a language (laughs) barrier thing, kind of. And so and so he thought when she was taking off her dress that we were going to straight up see tits. Right. And so. uh it, ever since that moment, my dad refused to let me watch anything with Jim Carrey in it, which is so crazy. Yeah, because it's like it, it was like, oh, it's not the writers of the movie. It's not the director of the movie. It's not the girl who took her dress off. It's Jim Carrey's fault. Yes, it's, <laughs> it's all Jim Carrey's fault. I find it fascinating when when parents get hung up on something. I, I had wars with my father over stuff that I wanted to have in the house that he didn't want in the house. Um, yeah. It was comedy albums. My dad found my Richard Pryor Same. records and my Cheech and Chong records. Mm-hmm. And holy shit, it was the oh, yeah. world. It was mm-hmm. Mad Magazine. Um, okay. My dad had a real problem with anything that taught you to question authority or that taught you to yeah. straight up so thumb comedy. your nose at the establishment. <laughs> Yeah, I yeah. Uh, and it was Mad. It was National Lampoon. It was any of those magazines. From oh that my era. god! Yeah, and he would get furious if he found them in the house. And then I, National Lampoon and Mad were both worse than Playboy in my house. But the mm-hmm. absolute <laughs> forbidden content in my house, where if he found it, he would shred it. He would leave it on my bed. He would be angry at me for days, like Fangoria. Oh my really? God, did my dad not get Fangoria magazine? And wow. It was, he thought they were like murder catalogs. He just did not understand at all why that I would it was look a at makeup a magazine. magazine. Like that. And I was like, no, yeah. no, it's the trick behind it. I want to know about the makeup. Right. I want to know about the, and I want to read about the movies and the people. And he, all he would see is the gore. And right. it would infuriate him. And so those movies were forbidden, the magazines were forbidden. It was just a battle for that stuff. And then he would turn around and take me to see like tightrope by Clint Eastwood, where there's 19 <laughs> sexual assaults and straight up yeah. violence, but it's Clint Eastwood. So that one's okay. And I right. never, and I could never get him to see the insane, like, yeah, it was crazy. It's so it's so funny how like some, you know, people, you know, movie lovers are usually like, Oh, Spielberg, that's the guy that I trust, like or, you know, Scorsese or like, I know what I'm getting when I see a Tarantino movie. But people like my parents and and what seems to be like your parents are very like Clint Eastwood. He's a trustworthy guy. He'll probably not make a bad movie where he makes a bad choice and does bad things to people. Yeah. Like. <laughs> Yeah. It's like he's an actor playing a role, man. Like <laughs> it has nothing to do with that. Like it has everything to do with like the writing and, you know, and not only that, like it, he's also playing the character so you can not be that asshole. You know yeah. what I mean? Like that's why he's doing it. You know, like it's not glorifying anything. But now that I have it's kids, wild. I do understand sort of there are moments where you're watching something. I, I've had certain movies I put on and I'll get to a scene. And I'm like, oh, I forgot this scene was in this movie. And it's mm. like, oh, my God. And then suddenly you're sitting yeah. through a hardcore sex scene and you're like, oh, my God, my kids are in the room. This is horrible. Mm-hmm. I, I understand now the other end of that equation, which is it's not that you're offended. It's not that you don't think it, it's just it's 
really fucking uncomfortable suddenly. It's, yeah. the, it's the weirdest <laughs> feeling. And now I kind of see my dad through a different filter. Like I, there were stories that I used to tell where I was like, he's a crazy person. And now I'm like, yeah, I get it. We were watching Neighbors, of course. the Belushi Ackroyd movie. And yeah. it was on home video. And I, I was very excited. I wanted to see it in the theater. They would not let me. So when it came out on home video, I'm like, okay, it's on home video. So we can watch it together. And then you can decide if it's good or, you know, we'll watch it together. They're like, all right, fine. So we're watching Neighbors and they are not enjoying any part of it. And yeah. we get to the scene where Aykroyd's daughter come, or Belushi's daughter comes home from college and mm-hmm. Dan Aykroyd is going through her suitcase and they're all standing around in the kitchen and he turns around and he goes, hey, Earl, I found a pair of your daughter's edible underwear. Mind if I take a bite of her cherry? And I just remember my uh-huh. dad jumping over me and kicking the VCR to eject the tape. Like he was so <laughs> that was over. And it, was, uh, and it would always make me laugh where the line was like, really, that's the line. That's the moment in the movie where you're like, done out yeah everything else was okay but out now <laughs> there were several of those where i'm like okay and then you go back and you watch the movie later and you're like that's the thing huh that's what broke him yeah that's <laughs> all right well yeah man i i completely relate to that so much man i mean the uh what what else is i was gonna say uh something in relation to uh to to what you were saying about neighbors um Oh, that like it, it, that usually happens where like you forget a lot of these awkward things. I, un, unfortunately, though, I love him. This happens a lot in John Hughes movies. Oh, yeah. You know, where oh, yeah. like you remember how beautiful it is and you're like, oh, man, like this movie's great. Like Uncle Buck is great. Like it has, you know, John Candy and Macaulay Culkin's first role. And you're like, never mind the sexual assault that happened near the third act and you're just like this is a movie for kids right like why is there (laughs) why is there a sexual assault like this is it's so strange you know but like yeah you're a lot of stuff absolutely right there's a lot of stuff that in sharing with them i've had to put parentheses around or really we, we have to talk through afterwards like how much things have changed and i do think my kids have become and i, I think their generation in general i think they are far more respectful of each other as people i think they that's good they get that people are they cover a wide spectrum of things and that there are mm-hmm. people of all side types and things and they're very accepting so i i love that i think my kids and and a lot of their friends they're really decent kids but when i show them that stuff it's it's like science fiction to them it is a different yeah. world their high school experience was mm-hmm. nothing like the john hughes stuff <laughs> so they watch it You're and they're absolutely like right. they're like that's interesting i mean it, that's not reality. Oh, that's fucking crazy. Yeah. Like, I'm so sorry <laughs> if you ever went through that. <laughs> that looks terrible, yeah. Dad. Um, I mean, I, the only John Hughes thing I related to growing up, which, like, you know, I'm a millennial, so I'm I'm older than your kids. But I, the only John Hughes thing I I actually related to was probably Pretty in Pink. I related to Ducky because I was definitely the girl's. Yeah, like I was definitely the girl's best friend who she thought he was gay, but really he had a crush on her. Mm -hmm. Like (laughs) I was definitely that guy, (laughs) you know, like Ducky is like the best character ever. Ducky's a great archetype. He's going to and that that performance, I think, will get rediscovered, and rediscovered and handed down. And I think that's why those things will end up kind of echoing is the stuff that does stay the same or the stuff that is genuinely kind of universally true. And it's funny what's yeah, and we you know, know that we we also know that Warner Brothers and Universal listens to this podcast. And if you're thinking about casting a new Ducky, I would be happy to play him. <laughs> there you um, go. So that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> but and anyway, what were you going to say? I'm sorry, what, I interrupted. No, it's it's just funny what sticks and what doesn't from those movies. I know for for my oldest, he there was a period where John Hughes was very important to him, and with Breakfast Club, and you know. Uh, 16 candles and weird stuff. like he loves those movies and they were yeah. there was a moment where they were really really important to him and then last year for christmas i found because he's a vinyl freak now and he wants to be a filmmaker and he's kind of getting to the point where he's getting ready to go to film school now and he's thinking about what he wants to do and definitely music is a big part of it and i think it's the huge soundtracks that more than anything he really yeah. was blown away by there's a box set a vinyl box set that's out now that was put together by John Hughes's music supervisor. 
that is really? every track of music from the John Hughes movies. So it's all the wow. unused things. It's all the stuff they couldn't get the rights to put in the albums originally. It's all the alternate takes of tracks. It's the uh, the Smiths cover by Dream Academy. It's like everything you could ever want from the John Hughes soundtracks in one giant vinyl box. And he's like, That's so I never cool. need to watch the movies again now. I have this. Yeah. This is what I love the most. And all the liner notes tell you what scene everything was used in. So you can go back and look at everything. But it's unreal. That's the best. And for him, that That's, is, yeah, he, he now, I think the way John used music is the thing that imprinted on him more than John's values. Oh or yeah. John's sensibilities in the eighties. It's that it's the idea of music being such a key part of setting mood and tone. Yeah. There's so many directors that do that. I mean, you know, Tarantino being one of them, uh, you know, and even, um, oh my goodness, why am I blanking on his name? Um, made um, Shaun of the Dead. Um, oh, Edgar Wright. Yeah, Edgar's, Edgar Wright. Edgar's a yeah. huge, it's funny who, because, you know, I grew up with a certain generation of directors who I looked up to. And so I'm mm. fascinated looking at who my kids now idolize, who their filmmaking yeah. heroes are. And Edgar's definitely a, a giant one. Love um, Edgar Wright, yeah. I think, uh, I know for Toshi, Sofia Coppola. And you want to talk oh, about yeah, somebody who Sophia just Coppola loves music and loves thinking about when he saw virgin suicides he was yeah. like that score that air score is everything man i can't get enough of it um, yeah i turned him on to Wong car Wai recently and just the way like in chunking express just the way he uses california dreaming he's like i can't believe one song didn't get to me after like i love that i love the way yeah. he did that and <laughs> yeah so it's interesting watching him now kind of I think he loves vibe movies and he loves movies that are more mood than they are, you know, story driven. And okay. he's kind of getting to a point now where he's his palette is getting much broader and much more interesting. Yeah, he must love Carpenter then. Oh, because Carpenter mean, is. Yeah, he grew up on <clears throat> Carpenter. That's yeah. I mean, it's come on. It's my it's in my house. Yeah. You know, you, you want to talk course. formative experiences <laughs> being on the Starman set at 14. And being treated the way I was by them um, yeah. was absolutely the defining experience of my life. Like he he opened the door just enough for a local Tennessee kid to come onto a set and kind of watch the way things worked and talk to them and answer questions and everything. And That's then so cool. left town. And it was like he had no idea. But just giving me that script and spending a day talking to me and and really treating me like somebody who deserved to have their questions answered was enough to make me go, I'm, this is right. I should be doing, I, like, I am 100% going to do this for the rest of my life, you know, yeah. and then coming full oh circle God. and working with him later. Um, it, 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 he is absolutely my film hero. Like he's my film mentor. Uh, there's really nobody yeah. larger than Carpenter in our house. I mean, God, yeah, right now, I mean, if you look behind me, that's, yeah. uh, that's the monster from pro-life. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. That's so true. Yeah, Carpenter Carpenter's awesome, man. I mean, he's he's one of those guys that uh that could do it all. I mean, at least in my opinion, like, you know, could write the music for the vibe and and just direct the shit out of it, write it, you know, mm -hmm. do all of it. And it was his entire vision. I mean, you could also say like Wes Anderson does that as well, you know. I mean, they're very completely different vibes. Like Wes Anderson is more like a Hallmark card that speaks French. But you it know, is that, but it is that same still. control of aesthetic. They both really control their their movies where Yeah. When you You're absolutely right. Even before you get the font, you know a Carpenter movie when you're watching the early Carpenter films. Like they all oh, yes. look <laughs> and feel a certain way and sound a certain way immediately. Um Yeah. And I do think I think that's that's something that um, when you're starting to learn about movies or where you're when you're really falling in love with movies, there's a reason those are the stylists that you kind of fall in love with because yeah. they're so drunk on movies. They're so drunk on like everything a movie can do. Edgar Wright yeah. is a perfect example of that. That guy is you just know his brain is overstuffed with every mm -hmm. film he's ever seen. And he can't yeah. help but have it all just pop back out anytime he's thinking about any shot or any sequence. It's all going to come yeah. back out. 
I mean, the the perfect example with Edgar Wright, at least for me, is Baby Driver. Like that movie is like watching a rock and roll music video for two hours. Like it's awesome. I think um, I'm sorry that we don't have the same kind of music video industry we did for a while. I think oh, a yeah. lot of really strong filmmakers came out of that. And I think there was mm-hmm. something about having to think about different sounds, different tones, different bands adapt your style to different things and just constantly be shooting that really made mm-hmm. those filmmakers strong. I, I oh, mean, yeah. Toshi's favorite film now is her, the Spike Jones film. Okay. Yeah. And he great movie. mourns the fact that we don't have new Spike Jones films every year as do mm. I, I truly don't get it, man. Spike should be yeah. crushing us on a regular basis. I think he is one of the strongest filmmakers we have. And I do think a lot of a lot of what he did once he made the jump to features was informed by the freedom he had in music videos to experiment because he always felt fearless in his movies. Like any idea I want to try, I'll try. Maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't. Maybe but it won't. I'm going to give yeah. it a swing. And I think yeah. Gondry's that way. I think Fincher's that way. I think, you know, Romanek and John Glazer. Like, I love these guys. Um, yeah. I really wish that was still a road to uh, becoming a filmmaker. I think less and less directors are coming out of there, though. Yeah, it's you're absolutely right. I mean, a lot of directors are like, I mean, the, I guess the best you could do is like, shoot a t-mobile commercial with an snl cast member like what else can you do you know what i mean like yeah you're you're absolutely right i don't think the digital shorts world is the same i i think there's such a a mill i you know i thought maybe funny or die was gonna be that kind of a production pipeline and i don't think it ever quite turned Mm -hmm. into one and i'm really kind of surprised because obviously there are dudes like peter atencio guys who uh, did a lot of this stuff and a lot of sketch comedy stuff who have real chops i think atencio's a yeah. A real filmmaker. Um, but I just don't think I, for whatever reason, I don't think it's producing filmmakers the same way that like the video scene did. I really thought right. the internet would have launched more people by now and it doesn't feel oh, like yeah. it's become that, that same thing. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're absolutely right. Um, I want to pivot just a little bit. Sure. Uh, we like to talk about snacks on this podcast. What were your favorite snacks growing up? And we can obviously talk about, the your personal favorite movie snacks as well and what you think uh everyone should have is the the per their movie snack i uh i god growing up well we moved like i said we moved a lot um one of my favorite places that we ever lived was chattanooga and part of that was because we lived very close to the little debbie plant and the little debbie factory actually had a shop that was attached to it where you could get all the little Debbie stuff for like a quarter of the price. They were just selling it right out of the factory essentially. And uh, that's that's where my parents would go and stock up. So we always had that stuff in our lunch boxes and stuff. And I, I was addicted as a kid to them. They were something else. Um, But yeah, I was, I mean, I grew up in the seventies, so it was all processed junk, man. It was all terrible. It was Kool-Aid and it was, you know, uh, uh, a lot of candy. I lived, I always lived near enough to a Seven Eleven or to a, a whatever else that my friends and I would go and blow our whole allowances on comic books and garbage. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, I think that was most of my diet for a good period there. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, once I started working and uh, started working in movie theaters and stuff, I, you work crazy hours at movie theaters. And so I really learned terrible eating habits. I, uh, Sure. I I learned a lot of fast food eating habits during that time. Um, Mm -hmm. I have to say, I think we are in a golden age of movie concessions. I I agree. I am now uh, here in Los Angeles. We've had a lot of theaters closed down since the pandemic. Yeah. We lost the Arclight chain. We lost a lot of theaters that I really love. Um, Yeah, Arclight was my favorite. Arclight was great, man. Um, So for me now, uh, because I am 20 minutes away I have a season pass and I pretty much exclusively go to the Alamo. Um, Hell yeah. And I, I love the Alamo. I think the Alamo is a terrific menu. It has changed the way we kind of snack at the movies now Mm -hmm. Um, because there is so many, there are so many different things and it's all really good. That's the thing. It's it's all really enjoyable. So like I have, I have become much more, I think open-minded about what I will eat at a movie theater. Um, Sure. I still am a, sweet and salty popcorn guy 
Um, Mm -hmm. I grew up with uh, grandparents who we would buy the big bowls of popcorn or the big bags of popcorn, and then they would shake M&Ms into the bag. Nice. So we would always have this, the salty, and then every now and then you just get the little, oh, hey, there's an M&M. So I love sweet and salty popcorn. That's to me, that is like the ultimate movie treat. Um, And I think in an ideal world, that's pretty much what I have. Uh, Yeah. But I have I've definitely opened my mind and uh, the Alamo has great pizza and great things like that. It's funny that I have become more used to it because I I used to be real church and state like you eat outside the goddamn yeah. theater or you eat popcorn and just don't it, it, all the other stuff just seems like too much yeah. to me. And they kind of, yeah, I don't want to smell your weird sandwich. Yeah. Like I just yeah. want don't popcorn bring, and that's it. Don't, don't, don't <laughs> sm- and you know, my mom would, my mom, especially on days where like I would, I would, as a kid, I would try to see movies. So many movies, I try on Saturdays to go and spend all day at a movie theater. And so my mom mm-hmm. would like put sandwiches in her purse and stuff. I had a lot of uh, <laughs> movie theater sandwiches, like handed over to me in the dark and stuff. But yeah, yeah it was, it was always, I really, for me, the ultimate version of that is just a great bowl of popcorn and a big, just plain Coke. I, that's what I like the most. Yeah. I'm a Southern kid primarily. So Coca-Cola was yeah. always the, the, the primary thing for us. Yeah. That's Southern water, man. Coke zero. I mean, now. that's yeah. The same, same. Yeah. And usually and when I'm at it's the, because uh, it's the only one that tastes like the old Coke. <laughs> No, you're absolutely right. You're right. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love the taste of aspartame and and mm-hmm. <laughs> and I love I love Diet Coke, but Coke Zero, um, especially when I'm at the AMC, put a little vanilla in that ba- bad boy. Oh, man, it's so good. Yeah. Like, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. That's I, do good love, stuff. I do love the and even like AMC stuff. I love like the freestyle machines and things. I really do yeah, think same. You know, snacking has gotten so much better for people at movie theaters. You have options mm-hmm. almost everywhere now. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, and, you know, I, I've yet to go to the Alamo, um, the Alamo Draft House. I, it's on like my movie nerd uh, bucket list. I'm sure when I'm out in L.A. doing a job at some point, I'll definitely go with someone. But um, I've only heard good things for some reason about their nachos. Their oh, nacho they great cheese nachos. is very they good. Chi- they do chips and queso. So they do a really good okay. bowl of queso. And um, yeah, they do that. They do churro popcorn. That's all cinnamon sugar. And they do. I mean, it's great. How are they not billionaires, man? (laughs) I know. I know. (laughs) It really is. Like this is I mean, they're they're breaking my mind right now. Like this is their new one be a thing is horribly addictive. And I, I have to avoid it because it's just bad for me is they do a big, warm pretzel that is everything bagel seasoned. And oh no way that's awesome so good and it comes with yeah. like a creamy jalapeno dip it's ridiculous oh yeah we like to talk about cereal on this podcast because okay. i feel like cereal is the food that encompasses childhood mm-hmm. uh everybody remembers when they were a kid watching cartoons and eating cereal oh yeah uh, what were your cereals growing up that you like to have in your rotation i uh i had a younger sister and uh we would always have to have our own boxes of cereal because there could be no overlap because there would <laughs> okay. be fist fights and murder. And it was already a battle for Saturday morning cartoon control, like who got what, who got to dictate yeah. what Saturday morning lineup we watched. And then on top of it, we had to have our own cereals. Um, I remember when cereals started getting wild. Like that was the exciting thing when the early yeah. 80s hit and they went from frosted flakes and corn pops and the basics. Which were all good, and I grew up on that stuff. I love Frosted Flakes. I love Corn Pops. I thought those were all good. Sugar Smacks were really good when I was a kid. But okay. man, when the '80s hit, and all of a sudden you had like Cookie Crisp, and it was like, what? Uh huh. Yeah. Cereals went crazy, man. All of a sudden, every cereal was an overload of sugar, and I was all aboard. I got every crazy <laughs> Star Wars cereal. I got any yep. cereals that were connected to a movie. Mr. T cereal was in my house. Like <laughs> I went nuts for all that stuff. And every week would be like a different, bo- it was a different adventure in cereal. Um, I yeah. truly thought it was a golden age of just horrifying sugar corn puffs in different forms. And yeah. I think I ate it all, man. I was a big fan of the, uh, the monsters. So Booberry and, uh, Count Chocula. Yeah, same. And mm-hmm. I thought all those were great. Um, and then, 
it was uh, I think the one that I really settled on the longest in the 80s was Waffle Crisp. Yeah, dude. Waffle Crisp a was a cereal. big one for us for a while. Uh, yeah. And then I got out of cereal for a long time and then I had kids and now cereal's back in my house all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And what kind of cereals are at your house now? Reese's Puffs. Uh, okay. And uh, anything Always from a great the choice. Crunch family. Uh, they okay. are big fans of uh, uh, Captain Crunch, Crunch with or berries, Catalina Crunch. Crunch without berries. Oops, all okay. berries, all of it. Like they uh, any Captain yeah. Crunch cereal is pretty much a big hit. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, you're you're talking to someone who's a cereal fiend. And so the the thing is, like when I hear Crunch, I'm like Captain Crunch or Catalina Crunch, because they're both very different things. Yes. Because <laughs> Catalina the Crunch, the Captain family. Yeah. yeah. OK, good, because because Catalina Crunch, uh, I talk about it on this podcast. Uh, the only the only way to know that you have a cereal that's not for kids is if it has a picture of a farm and a Bible verse on the back. <laughs> and that's that is Catalina Crunch. Yeah. All right. 100% um, not for children. <laughs> yeah. Um, so every episode of this podcast, uh, I like to review a box of cereal with my guest. Um, I, and so I usually like to pick a cereal that has something to do with my guests in some way, shape or form. So I spoke with my sponsors over at Kellogg's. And uh, now by sponsor, I have to reiterate this. Uh, I mean that I like them and I buy all of their products. And I spoke to... <laughs> I mean that I tweeted them repeatedly and they never got back to me. Excellent. So uh, Excellent. I went and bought it myself. Uh, so the cereal that I chose for you is Pandora Flakes. Awesome. <laughs> have you awesome. have you had this? We have not. And I am very okay. curious um, because, like I said, I used to buy every movie tie in. If it was even oh, yeah. remotely connected to a movie, they just you, had like the picture in the corner. How happy I would, I was. That would be an excuse you, to get it. All right. Yeah. Yeah. You can't tell me how happy I was when uh, when you said that you liked movie tie in cereals. I was like, great. I picked the perfect one. There you go. Um, uh, Griffin Newman's favorite cereal, uh, by the way. Um, I've heard. Yeah. Yeah. He's a fan. Yeah. He's a fan. And I had my first bowl of this uh, in preparation um, for this podcast, uh, maybe a few hours ago. I wanted to not like it, Drew. I really did Mm -hmm. not want to like it. And it's and for some strange reason, it just works. (laughs) Like the blueberry is kind of a that's kind of a no brainer. Like, I think that with the frosted flake sounds like a decent combo. Um, Yeah. Does it have marshmallows, too? No, it does not. It's it's the milk looking like glue that's making you think that it's it's All marshmallows. Right. All right. Yeah, I mean, um, blue flavor because it's not blueberry flavor. It's blue flavor. Yeah, it's 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 blue flavor. You're yeah. absolutely right. I'm always um, down with blue flavor. Blue flavor is pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It it kind of gives the uh, oops all berries a vibe. Uh, maybe a um, like a boo berry type of uh, flavor uh, to it because it's it's like the uh, I think they're called blueberry or blue moons is there what they're called, and um, and they're shaped like uh, like oops all berries, but they taste like boo berry um because okay. it's because they're different companies so yeah um at the end of the day man it's just it's just a bunch of corn and processed sugar <laughs> like it like it's gonna taste good a you different know? shape of um, corn and processed sugar mm. you're absolutely right yeah. a different t- yeah Yep. Yeah. Uh-huh. And for and for some strange reason, uh, if you eat enough of this, I heard uh, you'll stop masturbating. That's what Dr. <laughs> Kellogg said. So um, <laughs> which is why I personally needed a couple of bowls before I came onto the podcast, <laughs> because I was just going to be wanking it the whole time. I, but- <laughs> wish, I wish that we had deeper catalogs of movies for people to trip over on streaming services, because I would love for somebody at two in the morning morning to just be like anthony hopkins wait matthew broderick bridget Fun- what the fuck is this thing and put on road to wellville and about yes. 10 minutes in be like i'm having a stroke right this isn't real right? yeah this isn't a movie this, this is not You're happening right. Right. like we don't yeah. get to discover things what you're used to on cable like where you just trip across yeah. random weirdness late at night now yep and that's a great one yep. that is a truly lunatic film 
Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, my my biggest critique with this is that Tony doesn't look like a Navi, and it seems like the how easiest fix. That? Yeah, how do you miss that opportunity? Like, He's a cat. Yeah, like he he literally like his nose is blue for God's yes. sakes. Like it's it's already half there. Like yeah. why? <laughs> like yeah. somebody didn't do their homework. That, that, that whoever painted that final cover just got halfway done and then gave up because no, no yeah no. they they you just got totally they him. yeah man it would have been so much easier man for Although sure that does imply um, that somewhere tony's lifeless body is just laying inert in a tube and maybe they just don't want kids <laughs> thinking about that like the actual tony in a tube somewhere <laughs> well navi tony is running around they're like mm, i don't know I, <laughs> that's one joke you know, too much for us <laughs> You know, it's funny because my initial thought was like, do you think that Tony not being a Navi was a Cameron thing or it was a Kellogg's thing? And I kind of think it was a Kellogg's thing. I do, too. Like, I'm sure. I think Kellogg was like, sure, fucking make him blue. Go for it. That's great. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. (laughs) Why not? He's already he already kind of looks like one, you know, like it's it's wild, man. Yeah. But uh pandora flakes everybody uh it's still i i was gonna say frosted flakes but pandora flakes uh with blueberry flavored blue moons that's the cereal that i chose for drew mcweeney this episode uh i would give it i don't know man i i guess like a a four out of five it's not a perfect it's not a perfect cereal but like man it's so good and it also i will say this it reminds me how much Frosted Flakes is a really good cereal because I kind of forgot. It is. You know what I mean? It's kind of a quiet banger. Always doing yeah, its job. Yeah, like it's always doing its job. It's always been there for you. Mm-hmm. Like it's like uh it's it's like a <laughs> It's like the right woman for you. Like, you know what I mean? Like you're like, no, like I wanna like go fuck other people and she's like all right i'll wait for you like if you ever want kids i'll be here that's frosted flakes you know what i mean like (laughs) and like the cookie crisp those are like the one two hitters you know yeah Yeah, and they're they're flashy (laughs) and then you're done yeah you're like that wasn't as good as i thought it was gonna be yeah that wasn't as good as i thought it was gonna be and now i have diabetes actual chocolate chip cookies in my bowl (laughs) yeah you're absolutely i'm i'm disappointed yeah, you're absolutely right. And man, you know, speaking of 80s, I, I wanted to keep talking about this for a second. Um, Ralston made some fucking weird cereals, man. Like they made like E.T. cereal, yep. C-3PO's. Yep. I, I had they made both Herbal of those. Lows. I, I <laughs> ate C-3PO's. Uh, yeah. 100%. I ate Ewok cereal, I'm pretty sure. Um, Do you by any chance, and this is out of curiosity of being a cereal nerd do you remember what any of these tasted like and were they good c3po's were um uh very much like a uh corn puff but almost like a mapley outside um, okay and uh yeah they weren't bad c3po's were actually pretty decent um, okay but no the vast majority of these are like mr t cereal stuff like that just yeah. terrible cereal that is pressed into yeah. a new shape. And uh, and time after time, I would eat it and go, yeah, that's exactly like the other ones. It's just, you know, yeah. new whatever, new mold or whatever. Um, yeah, it would. It, I, I would get excited when one actually broke out and tasted like something. OK, yeah, it, it's funny because like I, I had a, a guest uh, on season one, uh, Stacy Gordon, who's a puppeteer on Sesame Street, and wow, she was talking cool about how, yeah, yeah, she's so sweet, man. Uh, she she puppeteers Julia on Sesame Street, um, and uh, but anyway, she was talking about how when she was a kid, the cereal that she wanted more than anything in the world was Garbage Pail or not Garbage Pail Kids, Cabbage Patch Kids cereal. Um, wow, I don't remember that one. And my, but she I bet was my like, sister would because she was obsessed with yeah. Them. Yeah. And and she was like, this cereal was the worst cereal oh. on the face of the earth. And and it was such a disappointment because we weren't like well off growing up. So my mom was like, nope, you wanted it. You have to eat this entire box. Oh, yeah. Because we're not. Yeah. And we're not buying another one until you eat this. That's a hundred percent. I remember that. Like if you made a mistake yeah. in the cereal aisle, tough shit. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's that would be when I become a really good salesman and convince my sister that she really wanted Mr. T cereal. Like, no, you do. <laughs> you love Mr. It's T. It's Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Yeah, you you, you know definitely want to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was was it uh was it still in stores when it was in Pee Wee's Big Adventure? No, I think it had been out of stores for a while by then. I think okay. it was I think it was around uh, Rocky three. I think it was early in Mr. T's sort of like big moment of fame. Yeah, that makes um, sense. Yeah, I it's Pee-wee's so much fun. Adventure, that, man. That's one of those things that it's it's hilarious that it is immortalized in uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Hilarious that that is yeah. the cereal that he's <laughs> that he's Dude, eating. I I got I got to be honest, man. That movie gets so little love. That's one of my favorite comedies of all time. Like we I a- I think that movie's so good. We did an amazing event about two years ago. I, I guess it was. Yeah, I think it was right. I, I think it was one of the first thing, big things after the pandemic started open back up where Paul Rubens mm-hmm. uh, showed Pee Wee's Big Adventure and then spoke for about oh an hour God. and a half afterwards. And it was just oh, wow. Paul came out, sat center stage and just started telling stories and then did Q&A. And um, it was remarkable. And what I really what I loved about it is. When I worked at Dave's Video, that Laserdisc store, uh, that was right before Paul's big arrest and before everything happened. And yeah. when he would come into the store, he had the long hair, just like pig pen, just a cloud of pot would come in before him. Right. And mm-hmm. it was very clear that the last thing in the world that he wanted was for anybody to say the words Pee Wee to him. Like he didn't yeah. want you to come near him. He didn't want to talk about it. If you wanted to talk to him about other stuff. He was fine. If I talked to him a couple of times about the groundlings and Cheech and Chong and things like that. And he was always yeah. perfectly amicable, but just no peewee. And you could tell it was off the table. And then to see him all those years later after the screening of the film and just the clear love he has for the character and for the way people continue to share the character. It was great. And yeah. you realize he came full circle. Like he must have finally had that moment where having lost it, he realized how much he valued that thing. And truly, yeah. I, I, he was grateful in talking about Pee Wee's Big Adventure now. You can tell he loves it dearly and is still super proud of it. Yeah, it's great when actors kind of lean back into something because, mm. and not even actors. I mean, I, uh, I've had this conversation with my friends before where I, I was like, the moment Michael Bolton leaned into the comedy of it all and took and didn't take himself so seriously that's when everybody started loving him again. You know what I mean? Because he had his moment. He had his moment, but then he leaned in with the lonely Island and now everybody loves him so much again, you know? And, and, and I think that when that happens with actors, you know, and, and, you know, it's very much almost like adolescence where it's like, you know, you're like, I don't want to be remembered as this thing. You know, like I'm much more than this thing. Mm-hmm. And then you realize like, man, I'm just glad anybody's listening to me at all. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I'm just I, glad anybody cares about something I did. I think it is you know, fascinating so. that we're about to get not only a new Michael Keaton Batman film, but a new Michael yeah. Keaton Beetlejuice film. That is right. crazy that that's finally happening. And it yeah, and honestly feels like every false start that they've had along the years. I'm glad it didn't mm-hmm. happen because I think every other time it would have felt more like just. Okay, I guess they're finally doing a Beetlejuice sequel, whatever. Yeah. But by making it this thing that has taken this long and for Michael Keaton to have finally kind of come back around to having his moment where everybody's like, oh, yeah, I love Michael Keaton, right? Of course. Now it kind of feels like the right time. Like we actually want it. It's not just a thing that is going to happen inevitably. So I do feel like for a lot of people, there comes a moment where you lean back in and kind of embrace who you are. And I think the audience a lot of times is really ready for you to do that and will reward you for it. Yeah, so much so. I I mean, I I was going to say you're absolutely right with the timing because not even Michael Keaton, but Winona with Stranger Things. Oh yeah. Um and and Tim Burton with Wednesday. Catherine O'Hara like, with Shit's Creek. I think everybody yeah, is it maybe the peak I mean, of them liter- being them. Yeah, like literally everybody's begging for this to come back. Yeah. You know, like I mean, it's it's the perfect time. You, and this only means that in a couple of years we're finally going to get a George of the Jungle with Brendan Fraser. <laughs> I would not be shocked if Universal's trying to figure out how to get him to fight a mummy again. <laughs> yeah. Right I mean, now. I 
I gotta be completely honest with you. I'm so down. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I, think, I, I love those me, mommy movies. I think movies. they are clearly trying to figure that out now. Like, yeah. But anybody who watched the love fest for him last year, who has of ever course. done business with him, is like, what do we have? What do we have? Yeah. We, what do we have? And like, yeah. <laughs> they're like, mail him all the baskets, say that you're sorry, and mm-hmm. let's ask him back. Because, I mean, the poor guy, man. I mean, and, and same thing with Key. Like, I, and I'm so happy that Key is getting the love fest again, or, or is getting the love fest now, because I want to see Key and everything. I want to see Brendan Fraser and everything. I want to see Michael Keaton and everything, you know? It was so weird, because like, for my age group, I was 14 for Temple of Doom. And he very much felt like he was representative of all the kids my age who had fallen in love with Star Wars and Indy. And yeah. Spielberg had to pick a kid to go on an adventure with Indiana Jones. And I think the natural inclination would have been to hate him because he got to go do it. But it was pretty much the opposite. I think everybody my age loved Key Hoi Kwan because He's my he favorite was character. doing what we wanted to do. And he was exactly. so cool. Yeah. He was so funny about yeah. it. Like that mm-hmm. was the thing he, and I think that was a pretty big moment for our generation. Like we really love that dude. And I do think there is something of that fulfillment of it's like an old friend you had lost track of last year. And all of a sudden Ki Hoi Kwan and for him to show back up and be so fully formed himself still, yeah. but like the adult, grown cool version of that it was a really wonderful moment i'm i'm glad that he had it but i think for my age group a lot of us it was really emotional watching him go through that whole gauntlet of stuff and just yeah it felt like this this shoe finally dropping on something that that had been unresolved since we were little and Mm -hmm. he really should never have gone away i'm very glad that he's back yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. Um, I wanted to talk with you about getting to work with with uh, Fincher or the Finch man, as uh, the Doughboys yep. like to call it uh, with with Vior, man. Um, I mean, if nobody's seen this, this is essentially it's a it's basically uh, some of the best film critics, at least in my opinion, just a love fest about film and getting to actually get a lot of these films, you know, on it's on Netflix and and you can watch it. It's a, it's a, how many, how many parts, six part series, six part series. Um, it's me, it's Walter Shaw. It's, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it it is, I think a real oddity, a Sasha Stone, Taylor Ramos, Tony Jaw. Um, I think it's a real oddity. And it's very much yeah. a case of, you know, David Fincher had some weight at Netflix because of Mindhunter, mm-hmm. because of House of Cards. And he just had this thing he wanted to try. And we got really yeah. lucky and got to try it with him. Um, and yeah, it was it. It's I can't think of a better dream job than to spend a couple of years talking about movies with David Fincher. Just <laughs> right. You just email back and forth with him about movies and about things that you're interested in until you find a thing that excites both of you. And then you just follow that thread for a while. And um, yeah, my email chains with him are some of my favorites just because he is uh, a true film nerd, like a deep knowledge film nerd um, yeah. and really funny. He is brutally dry. He is one of those guys who... Uh, even if it's a joke at your expense, you got to laugh. Yeah. Cause you're like, well, shit, that was a good one, man. Ouch. Yeah. But good. <laughs> like, <laughs> he is savagely funny. Um, yeah. And yeah. And I think the thing that I was most impressed by is that he has not lost a bit of that um, movie mania. Like I know a lot of filmmakers who don't love movies very much anymore, or at least they don't watch them the same way. They don't soak them in the same way. And I think making them is demit and, just working in the business has diminished some of that enjoyment for them. And I think he's yeah. the opposite. I think he still 100% will just go watch 15 movies in a row and love them and take them apart in his head. And like, he just still loves this stuff. Yeah. Agreed, man. Yeah. It's, it's wonderful. I would definitely recommend if you're a movie lover to watch Vior um, and and enjoy it, man, because they only got one season, sadly. Um, yeah, we wrote a, we yeah. wrote a second season and uh, yeah. it 
it was going to be bigger and more experimental. And I think that's where Netflix went. Yeah, no, we're good. Yeah, it's, uh, that's that's a cool idea. But no, we, we did one. It's it, I mean, at the end of the day, it's also weird that they said no to another mind hunter. You know what I mean? Because well, no, I that's actually that been show. misreported. Um, oh, really? They're not. Let's put it this way. There could still technically be another season of Mindhunter, but okay. for it to work narratively, everybody on that show has to get like 10 years older. Okay. They just, they got to age a little bit. Um, yeah. There was no other story to tell immediately after that. And I don't think old age makeup is the way to go. I don't think trying to age everybody up by 10 years is the way to go. I think yeah, me neither. if there's another chapter of Manhunter that happens, It'll be after some time has passed and everybody's gotten the chance to put some weight and some age on themselves and just kind of let nature take its course a little bit. Yeah. Um, I don't think he's totally done telling Mindhunter stories. I think he's got some more stuff under his belt. That's good to hear because yeah. I sincerely enjoyed that show yeah. uh, quite a bit. I also know uh, it's crazy expensive. Adventure. Like there's no question it's yeah. an expensive show. So who knows what will happen? Of course. But I don't think he's yeah. closed to that opportunity. And I don't think it was a case of Netflix canceling anything so much as there was nothing for them to approve because he wasn't ready to do anything else. And okay. I think won't be for a while. Yeah. I mean, I like that narrative more than <laughs> the Netflix yeah. pulling the plug. He's you still, know? And he's still working with them on stuff like there's a Chinatown spinoff sequel something okay. there's a jake Giddis yeah. something that's uh that he's yeah, been Tokyo working on with Town. robert town for fucking ever and talking mm -hmm. about and that sounds cool like i definitely think he still wants to be in the netflix business and vice versa um good but i think also he wanted to go make a couple of movies i think he'd done a lot of tv yeah, for a while i don't while. blame him did you yeah, see um him. did you watch his uh his third season episode of love death and robots I have not. I heard uh, your episode of Doughboys and how it's life changing. I just, I, yeah, I got to push that on people. If you're a Fincher fan at all, picture David Fincher's yeah. The Thing, but set on an 18th century sailing vessel. It's oh wow, fucking bananas, and it is so That's so grisly cool. and so unrelenting. It's it, kind of wild to see him just do straight up horror, which we've never really yeah. seen from him. Even though everything feels like it's in in the neighborhood. Um, yeah. Yeah. This is the first time you've ever just leaned in and done full on horror with Andrew Kevin Walker, the guy that wrote seven. And it's wow. It's great. It's so good. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. And it's uh, it's animated, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah Cause I remember you animated. talking. Yeah. I remember you talking about how you had a, an animated script and yeah. how people didn't want animated horror. And you're like, this is literally. It was something like, we, uh, we really tried to get off the ground in the uh, in the 90s when I first moved out here. Um, I a lot of the first people I met were animators and I just find yeah. I love animation. I'm fascinated by it as an art form. Same. Um, I am frustrated by the fact that we think about it in such a small way in America uh, mm -hmm. when really any story can be animated and should be and could be. Absolutely I, right. I Anime. don't understand why yeah. we just tell children's stories, but we really yeah. pushed this idea. We uh, optioned a book and we had this Disney animator that we were working with, guy who worked for Don Bluth and Disney and Ralph Bakshi. He had done basically uh, mentored under everybody. And so he Beautiful. put together our art package and we had this whole movie designed and it was wild looking. And we mm -hmm. wanted to do a mix of CG and conventional cell animation at a time when Disney hadn't really started doing that yet. And uh, everybody was just like, you guys are nuts. None of the stuff you're talking about makes any sense. It won't work. And uh, I really feel like somebody at some point is going to make that jump in American animation. And when they do and they make either a giant science fiction movie or a giant horror movie and they do it animated and they treat it seriously for adults, they are going to make a jillion dollars and then everybody yeah. else will start ripping them off. But somebody yeah. will have to be first and somebody will finally break the bank when they do it. Yeah. And the, the thing is, that's frustrating. And like, you know, I, you know, and we talked about this off air. I'm not in the WGA, though I stand with the WGA. Um, and Thanks, uh, I'm I'm an actor, you know, but at the same time, it's like, you know, I, you know, I w when it comes to like making movies and things like that, it's almost like these companies, these film companies are like banks and they're like, yeah. well, we know that a movie with fast cars is going to sell, you know, 
but not this story that we've never heard of or whatever. And that's why we're getting less and less original ideas. Oh, it used to to be a balance. No, you're right. You're absolutely right. Like tent poles. Yeah. The entire idea of a tent pole was that you could have a couple of tent poles during the year, big event movies that seem like fairly safe bets. And then you could use that to make a lot of other things that you took chances on. And you could support small voices and bigger voices and do dramas and do adult movies and do things for small budgets and bigger budgets. And the tent poles were just to hold up the tent. All we have now, if you go into these tents, is just tent poles. There's no place for anybody to stand. (laughs) It's just poles. That's not a tent. That's yeah. It's crazy. You're absolutely right. And that that truly is. It's that same mindset that has taken over in so many American businesses now where it's constant growth is the only thing that matters. It is shareholder returns are the only thing that matters. And so everything is done by algorithm and done to be as safe and as homogenous as possible. And truly, we're going to see it break. It will break soon. And when it breaks, Mm -hmm. it'll be like it was in the 70s when, you know, the studios were starting to collapse and suddenly Easy Rider pointed out this new way of making movie. That will happen again. Somebody will do it. I just don't know where, I don't know what form it's going to come in, but it's going to yeah. have to because there's a generation that's growing up starving for stuff that is organic and real and natural and not yeah. chapter 47 of something. And mm-hmm. so it'll happen. It's a reaction. It's inevitable. Well, I don't want to hold you too much longer. I've gi- You've given me so much of your time sure. and I really, really appreciate you um, doing this podcast. And before I ask you these last couple of questions, uh, I just wanted to let you know that you as a critic uh, just mean so much to me. Well, and as a journalist, you mean so much to me. Uh, I love Formerly Dangerous. Uh, I, like I subscribed to that newsletter a couple of years ago. Thank and you, like, man. I, I mean, yeah, this is just, if nothing else, it's, this is like a nerdgasm for me. You know what I mean? So oh, well, thank you. I so appreciate this it. is, yeah. Um, so this has been super fun and I, and I just didn't want that to go unnoticed or untold. Uh, so, um, but the first question that I have, the first of the last questions I have for you is what advice would you give to your younger self if you could talk to them right now? Um, I have one specific piece of advice, which is patience. Um, mm-hmm. I, uh, I felt like I was owed a career when I got here because I loved movies so much and, um, and things happened fairly quickly for me. I I managed to start meeting people and I managed to start getting things read and I managed to get in front of people, but I was always impatient and I was always impatient that people should just assume that I know what's that I'm right because I'm right. Mm -hmm. Right. And when you're 20, 21, 22, you, you do not have any experience yet in dealing with other people or collaborating or understanding that there are people with actual life experience that know more than you. And uh, I really, I was wildly arrogant at the beginning of my career and I have Mm -hmm. been intemperate throughout my career. I have written things that I should not have written. I have reacted in ways I shouldn't have reacted. Um, You know, Moriarty at Ain't It Cool News was a a wonderful alter ego for me, but it was also a, a chance for me to indulge my worst tendencies. And I was a bully sometimes. Um, yeah. and a lot of it was impatience. I, I just was so impatient with people to, you're, you're making the wrong thing. You're doing the wrong thing. You're saying that and I, I would be impatient and there are so many better ways to communicate ideas and to get things across to people. And I am grateful that I have had the length of time I've had writing to learn how to do that and become better at that and, um, and learn how to communicate in ways that I think are encouraging and positive rather than um, negative and pessimistic. And uh, I think younger me could have used a big dose of older me's sense of temperance. Yeah. That's, that's a great way to answer that question. Um, There's no wrong way to answer that question, but that is the right answer. (laughs) Um, So and, the, and my last question I have for you is what do you think that that young kid that loved movies so much would think of who you are now? I think he would be, um, I think he would be satisfied. I think he would be excited by the Good. stories, um, excited by the experiences. 
and amazed that he got as close to it as he did. Um, yeah. Every film set I've ever visited has been a privilege. Every filmmaker who's ever opened the process up to me and shared it with me, uh, I am blown away that they ever did it. Um, and every yeah. time I've made a film or been part of a film or even been in development on something that didn't get made, um, I am grateful that somebody took a chance on trying to get that thing off the ground. Um, I find it amazing that I have lasted as long as I have at this. Um, you know, because I didn't know anybody when I moved down here. I, I moved to Los Angeles mm -hmm. knowing absolutely no one who worked in this business. Mm -hmm. And I do think that when you're starting from zero, it's a really tough fight. And, I, you know, I'm not saying that I think it's easy for people who uh, grow up around this business. I think it's hard for everybody. I think everybody has to fight right. for what they have. But I do wish, you know, I had had more exposure to it when I was young. I wish I'd had more of a running start at it, or I wish I'd had a better sense of what I needed to do to get into it. Um, I moved out here in 1990, man, I was green and I was just, yeah. uh, all I had was a fistful of scripts and the absolute refusal to not talk to somebody. Like if I saw somebody, I would talk to them. I didn't care who they were. I didn't care how famous they were. I was fearless when I moved to LA and yeah, insane, but fearless. And it, it worked. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely, I think I would be pleased. I think I would be surprised by where I've ended up. And I used to kid with um, Rebecca Swan, my, my co-writer for many years. I used to kid yeah. with her when we were young that, or not kid, but I used to say after I've made my, 35 movies and I've won my stack of Oscars and I've topped the box office. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give it all up and teach for a few years. I really just want to teach movies. <laughs> I just want to teach film and kind of pass yeah. that on. And what's weird is I do think in a lot of my career, I have been able to um, help foster a love of movies in a really big audience that I never would have yep. expected. And I have met, so many people over the years who said, I read you in high school. I read you in junior high. I, you kind of taught me how to love movies or you kind of gave me permission to love movies the way I did or yep. in. And I think that is more valuable than a lot of what I thought I was going to do. So I, I am enormously grateful that that is the thing that I kind of have built is this legacy of people that have conversations about movies now in a way that is in some way influenced by me. And if that is a positive thing, then I'm super happy because that is mm -hmm. the main thing I want to pass on that this art form matters, yeah. that it will continue to matter. It's a hundred years old. We are watching things that are a hundred years old. We are going to continue to watch things a hundred years from now that we're making right now. And being part of that is an honor and a privilege and talking about it is a blast. And I really yeah. wish, you know, that that conversation could be positive more than it is sometimes online. But I do think that there's a lot of people who are having that conversation. Agreed, man. I mean, you know, when you were saying that you wanted to like, once you've won your Oscars that you wanted to teach <laughs> and like, you know, it's so, it's so funny that you say that because I would argue that most of your career has been teaching. Because, for example, you taught like and this is just a personal thing. You taught me how to love film the way that I love film. Like mm -hmm. and, and you know, I don't I don't you know, and I don't mean to say that to like, you know, give you an ego boost or anything. But I'm just being honest, like like as somebody who is just a fan of yours and a fan of your writing and the way that you talk about film, like you taught me that it's more than that that film sucks or like that's yeah. you know that that this film is is awesome but it's like why like why like and not only that it doesn't suck it just wasn't made for you like who is yeah. it made for you know like that kind of thing and giving everything a positive spin well, as that, opposed that to while, just being man. like that is not course, where any it takes of us everyone start. a while but yeah it's it's something yeah, that i yeah. really and i do think part of that comes from you know trying to make things I think after you've yeah. done it a few times, you realize it's a fucking miracle. Like it's a miracle. Yeah. And you're so of, right. I'll tell you one of the things that I, I never get tired of Mike is that moment. And it happens. It either happens or it doesn't. You, you put a movie on and I don't know, five, 10 minutes of the movie go by 
And one of two things happens. Either I settle in because I know I'm in good hands. Whatever, mm-hmm. Whatever's going to happen. I may not love every part of this thing, but a filmmaker is doing this. There's, there's yeah. somebody who knows what they're doing. And so I can just let go and I can just surrender to whatever experience I'm about to have. Or you realize, all right, this just didn't come together. Like the, the, the soup didn't work. The ingredients don't mix. It's fine. And you just, and, at a, and then you just kind of let it go. But I've gotten a lot less angry about films over the years. And I think I took them personally right. when I was young. I used to, I used to get so upset by a bad film. Like, why did you do yeah. that to me? <laughs> yeah. And, I think now you realize that when they come together, when that magic trick happens and when you're watching a movie and it all clicks and suddenly, yep, I'm in and I'm just, it's working and I buy it and I love these people. That magic trick is something that we all chase. And I respect the chase more than anything at this point and the effort that people make to make that magic trick happen, man. And, uh, and when it does, it's still my very favorite thing. Yeah, you're absolutely right. What a way to end it, man. Um, Drew McWeeny, everybody, where can all of the besties find you? Uh, I know you have a sub stack and uh, if they can follow you on Instagram, you can just shout it out and plug away. I am uh, I am at two different sub stacks. You can find me at Drew McWeeny.substack.com, which is formerly mm-hmm. dangerous. That is uh, not so much film reviews anymore. Um, I am working on a project that I will be able to announce at some point later this year once the writer's strike mm-hmm. is hopefully resolved. Um, and so the newsletter will be partially about that project, but it's also a look back at films that I think are important and deserve a spotlight that, uh, don't necessarily get it as often as they should. I'm about to publish a piece on Dogfight, the River Phoenix film, which I, oh, that's a great film. I adore that. That's a great film. Great little movie. So I'm about to publish a piece on that. Um, my other sub stack is the last eighties newsletter.substack.com. And I have Mm -hmm. picked up a project that I initially did as a podcast where I am reviewing every film released in America in the 1980s in chronological yeah. order because I'm an yeah. insane person. Um, <laughs> yeah, you are insane. So every single film from the decade and I'm in mid 81 yeah. right now. So, uh, yeah. Wow. Um, so those two newsletters in are 40 are both, years. You'll be done. <laughs> oh my God. It's, it's going to be quite the, th- quite the thing. Um, yeah, but, uh, well, we haven't gotten there yet, but we'll get there. <laughs> um, but you can also find me Drew McWeeny, uh, just at Drew McQueenie on Twitter. Um, I'm on Blue yeah. Sky now. I think it's Drew McQueenie.bluesky.social and Instagram as okay. well. So, and Letterboxd. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, for anybody that's interested uh, in listening to that 80s movie podcast, it was called 80s All Over. Um, I was a subscriber of that podcast. Great, great concept. Thank you, man. Which is, it's essentially an audio version of what Drew is doing on his Substack right now. It was just um, impossible to get three of us on the same page to do it consistently for the whole thing. Yeah. But it was, yeah, it was a cool that. attempt. We We made a real run at it. So... Mm-hmm. You sure did. Yeah, it's it was a great premise. I, I loved it. Um, now, for me, you can find me on Instagram at Mike Valdez. You can follow me on TikTok at official Mike Valdez. You can go to the kid from up dot com. That is my website, at least until Disney sues me. And uh, other than that, thank you so much for listening. Uh, I hope you have a great week. Bye, besties. Bye.